morning. I want to take a minute and have consider. Have you ever encountered someone that simply could do no wrong? Well, at least in their own eyes. One who thought that the rules were simply an inconvenience and just didn't apply to them. Consider for a moment Absalom, the son of King David. We can read in 2 Samuel 13 about he conspired to kill his half-brother Amon. After Amon raped his sister, he spent two years conspiring before finally taking Amon's life. Or how he fled from the king to Geshur. And how once David was comforted about the loss of his son Amon, how David longed for Absalom's return. Or how David's advisor, Joab, conspired to bring Absalom back. Because he knew that the king longed for his son. And once he was back in Jerusalem, how Absalom spent another two years outside the presence of the king. Some of the rules just didn't seem to apply to Absalom. So how was Absalom described? We can see in 2 Samuel 14 and verse 25, it says, Now in all Israel there was no one who was praised as much as Absalom. For his good looks, from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And when he cut the hair of his head at the end of every year, he cut it because it was heavy on him. When he cut it, he weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels, according to the king's standard. Give you an idea, a shekel was about two to five ounces. We're not totally sure. That means when he cut his hair, it was anywhere from 25 pounds up to 62 and a half pounds of hair. That is quite a lot of hair, even at the lower range. But just the description that he is described as the fairest of the land, the fairest of everyone, there was no blemish in him. Which what kind of attitude that creates in the person who the Bible describes as having no blemish, at least on the outside. So after two years back in Jerusalem, away from the presence of the king, Absalom sent for Joab. Remember that Joab had conspired to bring Absalom back. Now we, but now we read that Joab was not willing to come to him. Continuing in 2 Samuel 14, jumping down to verse 28. There's an Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem, but did not see the king's face. Therefore, Absalom sent to Joab to send him to the king, but he would not come to him. And when he sent again the second time, he would not come. So, here's where we get into Absalom's state of mentality of his mental state. Verse 30. So he sent to his servants, See, Job's field is near mine, and he has barley there. Go and set it on fire. What better way to get someone's attention, right? Set their field on fire. And Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Job arose and came to Absalom's house, because someone set your field on fire, wouldn't you come to their house? And said to him, Why have your servants set my field on fire? And Absalom answered, Joab, Look, I sent to you, saying, Come here, so that I may send you to the king, to say, Why have I come from Geshur? It would be better for me to be there still. Now therefore, let me see the king's face, but if there is any... Iniquity in me, let him execute me. 
So Joab went to the king and told him, and when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king. Then the king kissed Absalom. You can see the attitude that Absalom had, how he was known for being without blemish physically. But yet, as the king's son, he called for the king's advisor, and yet the king's advisor didn't come. So what did he do? He set the king's advisor's field on fire to get his attention. Continue in 2 Samuel 15, starting in verse 1. It says, But after this it happened that Absalom provided for himself chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Wait a minute. I thought this was the king's son, not the king, right? Keep that in mind. So now Absalom would rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. So it was whenever... Whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision, that Absalom would call to him and say, What city are you from? And he would say, Your servant is from such and such a tribe. Then Absalom would say to him, Look, your case is good and right, but there is no deputy to the king to hear you. Moreover, Absalom would say, Oh, that I were made a judge in the land. And everyone who has any suit or cause would come to me, that I would give him justice. And so it was, whenever anyone came near to bow down to him, that he would put his hand and take him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Imagine the son of the king who that just wasn't good enough. He had to have the chariot. He had to have the horses. He had to have the 50 men. But even that wasn't good enough. He had to stand by the gate and welcome those who came in, but not just welcome them, but to say that, hey, there's no one that can take your case. But if I could take your case, then I would seek your justice. And instead of those who would bow down and pay him honor as the son of the king, he would raise them up. He would take them and say, don't bow down to me. And through that, he stole their hearts. Continuing in verse 7. It says, Now it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said to the king, Please let me go to Hebron and pay the vow which I made to the Lord. For your servant took a vow while I dwelt in Geshur in Syria, saying, If the Lord indeed brings me back to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. And the king said to him, Go in peace. So he arose to Hebron. Now Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigns in Hebron. And we see just the sheer audacity of Absalom. How he put himself first with the chariots, the horses, the 50 men who were to run before him. How he stole the hearts of the people. And then positioned himself to seize the, th the throne by coercion. The rules just simply didn't apply to Absalom. I know no other way to describe Absalom but the term, a modern term we use of entitled. He put himself first. He was the first. He thought the rules didn't apply to him and that he would simply do as he wished. Because after all, he was the king's son. It was his already, right? We need to be cautious not to fall into the same mindset. Well, this morning, I want to talk to you about combating entitlement. And while the Bible specifically doesn't mention the modern concept of entitlement, there are several parts of entitlement, how we describe entitlement, that are directly addressed. But first off, let's start with a definition. Because it gets us all on the same page and thinking of the same, in the same line. So, 
Merriam-Webster describes entitlement as one of four things. One is a state or condition of being entitled, or a right. Or, it says, the rights to benefits specifically, especially by law or contract. So I have a title, therefore I am entitled to whatever. Or, it is the belief that one is deserving of or entitled to certain privileges. Now that is the definition we're going to go off of this morning. And then the fourth definition is a government program providing benefits to members of a specific group. So an entitlement, something you are you've given. But we're going to go off the, the third definition is a belief that one is deserving or entitled to certain privileges. I deserve this because I am me, because of no other factor. Absalom was entitled. He believed that he had the crown, the kingdom, simply because he was who he was. He was the fairest of the land. He was the king's son. Therefore, he deserved the 50 men. He deserved the chariot and the horses and the praise at the gate. Now, Psychology Today had an article back in 2022. It's titled, Why Americans Are Frustrated, Entitled, and Judgmental. I'll read just a portion of that article. Now, author uh, Stephen Stosny, speaking about entitlement, says a sense of entitlement is a tacit belief that your rights are superior to other people's. That your right to get something is superior to someone else's right not to give it to you. Entitlement has reached a point where media voices feel entitled to control what other people think and to shame those who think for themselves. Entitlement and frustration are inexorably linked. Once we're over five and not cute anymore, the world is unlikely to meet our entitled demands. Entitlement breeds resentment and resentment increases entitlement. Seems like a circle, right? The world is so unfair. I shouldn't have to wait in line, too. Or they have a nice car. Why can't I have that? Frustration and resentment over media discourse inevitably bleed into our personal lives. Entitlement, we can see, is rampant in our world especially in our country, and can bleed into the church. So what about entitlement in the Bible? I've already said that the Bible specifically doesn't use the term entitlement, at least in not in that modern sense. But there are several passages that address the attitudes and behavior that can be associated with a sense of entitlement. So first, we're going to go over to Philippians. Philippians 2, and starting in verse 3. Philippians 2 and verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. This verse emphasizes the importance of humility, as well as considering the needs of others above one's own desires. A sense of entitlement always puts me first. I am above everyone else. I am better than everyone else. And that leads to a lack of humility, a lack of putting others first, a lack of even considering others. The sense of considering others as a complete counter argument to those who are entitled, a counter mentality. So continuing that same thought, we're going to go back to Luke or over to Luke chapter 14. Luke 14 and verse 11. 
says, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now think back to our illustration with Absalom. Was Absalom exalted, or did he exalt himself? Well, I think it's pretty clear that he pushed himself forward rather than someone else exalting him. Reminds believers here, Jesus specifically, that the pride and an inflated sense of self-importance can lead to disappointment and downfall, while humility can lead to true honor and recognition. Those who are entitled push themselves first. And what would a discussion of entitlement be without going to Proverbs? So Proverbs chapter 16. Or 16 and verse 18. Most of us can quote this. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Cautions against an arrogant attitude and the belief that one deserves special treatment or privileges as it can ultimately lead to, our ne to negative consequences. And if we were to continue to read in 2 Samuel, we know that Absalom, after seizing the throne, had the army of his father come through and ultimately dispose him. He was not free from the ramifications or the consequences of his actions. So, what are the signs of someone who's entitled? The sins or signs of entitlement refer to the attitude or belief that one deserves certain privileges, rights, or possessions without having earned them, without considering the needs and rights of others. And this sense of entitlement can lead to various sinful behaviors, such as pride, selfishness, greed, as well as a lack of empathy or compassion. So first take a look at pride. So entitlement often feeds into pride, as an individual believe, individuals believe that they are superior or more deserving than others. This pride can lead to arrogance as well as a disregard for the values and the worth of others. If I'm constantly putting myself first, then that means I'm constantly putting everyone else behind me or below me. Continuing in Proverbs, turn over to chapter 11 and in verse 2. It says, when pride comes, then comes shame. And with the humble is wisdom. Interestingly, the Bible mentions the word pride about 46 times. The majority of those are between Proverbs and Psalms. And it's never in a good light. But how about selfishness? So entitlement can also cause a, and foster a self-centered mindset where individuals prioritize their own desires, their needs above those of others. This can result in neglecting the well-being and interests of others, leading to actions that are contrary to the biblical principles of love and selfishness. Go back to the New Testament. We're talking about a practical aspect, so let's go over to the book of James. James 3, and we'll be reading verse 16. So James 3 and 16 it says, For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Or as the ESV translates, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Selfishness breeds disorder, as well as other vile practices. Now, entitlement. If I am entitled, that means I can get whatever I want. I have the sense of it is mine already, so I'm just going to take it. Now, we call that greed. I want what you have. So the sense of entitlement can fuel greed. As individuals may believe they are entitled to accumulate wealth, possessions, and power at the expense of others. This greed can lead only to justice, exploitation, and a lack of generosity or stewardship. 
Go to First John in chapter two. Verse John two and in verse sixteen. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Greed and selfishness and the pride of life do not come from God. Finally, a sense of entitlement or a mindset of entitlement breeds a lack of empathy or compassion. Entitlement can blind others or blind individuals to the struggles, sufferings, and the needs of others. This lack of empathy or compassion can manifest in a disregard for the poor, marginalization, and vulnerable, as well as an unwillingness to extend grace and forgiveness to others. You can see in Colossians, Colossians 3 and verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Entitlement breeds a lack of empathy or compassion to where the grace and forgiveness is not extended to those who need it and those who deserve it. So now that we've gone through a definition, we know what entitlement is. We know how to spot it, the signs that are in entitlements, whether it be pride or selfishness or greed, but how do we combat it? How do we fight against entitlements? Well, the first thing I would suggest is humility. The Bible consistently encourages humility and warns against pride, which is closely related to entitlements. Again, going back to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 16 and verse 18 and 19 this time. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. But to be of a humble spirit with the lowly, or better to be a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Believers are called to, be hum to humble themselves and acknowledge their reliance on God's grace. Even that same thought back in the book of James, James 4, reading verse 6. So James 4 and 6. But he gives, he being the Lord, gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Those who are proud, God resists them. He draws away from them. He cannot be close to them. But he gives grace to the humble. Now, if we were to combat entitlement through humility, also offer, we can combat it through gratitude. Entitlement often stems from a lack of gratitude for what one already has. However, the Bible emphasizes the importance of being thankful in all circumstances. Let's see Apostle Paul speaking in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 15. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourself and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Paul is teaching the Thessalonians and us to recognize that everything we have is a gift from God and that we should not take anything for granted. Those who are entitled often take 
what they have for granted because they constantly want more. Continuing that same thought in the book of James, James 1 and 17. As for every good gift and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Every good gift is from God. Now, after we've exercised our humility and practiced that, after we've practiced our gratitude, say we can show combat entitlement through a servant leadership. Jesus set the ultimate example for, of a servant leader as he humbly washed his disciples' feet. See, in John 13, 2 through 5, it says, During the supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist, then he poured water in a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. How many of our leaders today would stoop down to wash someone's feet? I would guess not many. And those who have a sense of entitlement to think better of themselves definitely wouldn't even bother. Well, if the Bible encourages believers to follow this example that Jesus set, to serve others selflessly rather than seeking one's gain or recognition. See that same concept in Philippians, Philippians 2, verse 3. It says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Through acts of servant leadership, we put others first. Above ourselves, we stoop and wash the feet of our brothers. We stoop and wash the feet of those around us who we may think are not deserving, but they are de if Christ washed the feet of his disciples, shouldn't we act similar? To continue combating entitlement, how about through contentment? Entitlement also arises from a constant desire for more, more and more, leading to dissatisfaction with what one already possesses. However, the Bible teaches contentment as a virtue. And Hebrews 13, 5 through 6 says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Be content. The same thought is in 1 Timothy 6. 6 through 8, it says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, but if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. The emphasize is the value of being satisfied with what one has, rather than constantly seeking more. I know that goes against our American mentality but we need to emphasize a biblical mindset in our lives. Entitlement often stems from a lack of contentment and an insatiable desire for material possessions or recognition. So after we've exercised and practiced humility, gratitude as well as servant leadership and contentment, would offer that we need to exercise stewardship. 
The Bible teaches that everything we have is entrusted to us by myself, the neighbor next door, by God. Everything we have is from God. And we are called to be the good stewards of his blessings. This includes our time, resources, and relationships. Turn over to Luke, Luke chapter 12. Luke 12 and verse 47 and 48. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not, not know yet committed these things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given from him much will be required and to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. Entitlement disregards this responsibility and focuses solely on the personal gain. We cannot focus only on the gains we see to ourselves. You can see that the Bible condemns entitlement as well as promotes Humility, gratitude, servant leadership, and contentment, and stewardship. As believers, we are called to recognize our dependence on God. Be grateful for his blessings. Serve others selflessly. Find contentment in what we have and responsibly steward the resources we are given. By adopting these biblical principles, we can combat the mindset of entitlement and live a life that brings glory to God. So, have you ever encountered someone with an entitled mind? Was that person you? We've seen today that while the Bible doesn't specifically spell out entitlement in our modern meaning, the word, however, the traits of an entitled person are definitely described and frankly, not in a desirable light. We, as those set apart from the world, need to run from the traits of an entitled person. Pride, selfishness, greed, and lack of compassion, we need to run from. But seek to show humility, gratitude, a servant's heart, and our leadership, contentment and what we have, as well as a stewardship, because we don't own any of this. All things belong to God. But do we? We read Jesus uh, stating in John 14, verse 15, it says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Seems pretty simple, right? Simple in words, simple in concept, more difficult in application and action. So have we followed his commandments? There is no time like the present to do so, to plunge beneath the water that's behind and remove the sins which stain your soul. Don't wait. Don't have a spirit of entitlement that present, prevents you from humbly, from humbling yourself before the Lord. You may not get another chance. So those who have need, prayer or baptism, come forward as we stand and sing the song of invitation. <laughs>